Hello, you are listening to the Divorce University Online Podcast with your hosts, Thomas and Tammy Ferreira. Hi, I'm Tammy. And I'm Thomas. And we are back, and Thomas is going to tell us what we're talking about this week. Today we're talking about killer strategies for custody motions. And we're not consi- we're not saying kill the person. That's the totally different yeah, thing. Yeah, it's not a not to be taken to metaphor. Yes. I mean, these are killer strategies. Awesome strategies. Kick right. butt strategies. Now, I'll tell you, you know, aside from Tammy, who kind of birthed this idea, uh, it's, you know, when she said this to me, I realized that there are so many cases that, that come to me that I either take over or, or uh, are, am involved in where the person just goes, oh, I don't have enough parenting time. I'm going to file a motion. Okay. Yeah, this is the thing that happens most commonly to me when people con- reach out to me um, that, you know, are like kind of new to my coaching services or want to learn about them or whatever. This is one of the big things is that they're ready to just fire off them. Well, I'm going to, a lot of times they're calling to go, well, I'm trying to figure out, should I file contempt? Should I file a modification for a parenting plan? Should I file a motion for reconsideration or should I just appeal? Right. And it's like, no, 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 and no. Right, right. You got to back up and get your ducks in a row, dude. Right. A- after you lose in court, you have a final judgment and there's a public policy in every state where that protects the finality of judgments. So if you got a custody result that you don't like, uh, then you have to ha- show a change of circumstances to change that order. Right. You need to get your, you have to address what the court's concerns were. Right. It for it, Like if you got an extreme, well, not even an extreme, but if you got a certain outcome, there were certain things the court considered. And like, especially if one parent has very minimal parenting time or something like that, there's always some concern the court has that needs to be addressed. So right. you're just running right back in and going, oh, judge, I think you were wrong. I want you to find a different, right. I, want, I want you to make a different finding. <laughs> it's just going to be. Can I, can I no. tell a story? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I was sitting. No, in... no stories from you today. Okay. Yeah, this may have, I may have told the story before. Okay, but... we'll hear it again. <laughs> but uh, I was waiting. I was on a domestic violence case. I was defending it, and uh, it, it was in Riverside. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's where all the fun stuff. Happens. Yeah, we... all the all the really fun showy court <laughs> stuff happens in Riverside. Yeah, because it's the Wild West. It is. It's like draw, <laughs> say your prayers, varmint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> oh well, and I shouldn't say that. I mean, it's not fun if you're the one yeah. going through it. I mean, it's not fun like that. But it's like it just. What seems was the like name of always... the judge out there? It was. Um... It's always a little bit crazy. It there. was. It was uh, a famous name of a judge, and I'm trying to remember what it was. I don't know, but anyway, uh, with your but at, at any rate, I'm sitting there watching all the cases that are going before me, right? Uh, and this custody motion comes up. And the mom, <laughs> I know what you're going to yeah. tell. Go ahead. So, so mom's argument is, you know, he, he keeps bringing this same motion over and over again. And, and the court looks at this guy and says, sir, how many times are you going to bring this same motion before this court? And the guy, I kid you not. He said, as many times as it takes. <laughs> <laughs> right. And the problem with that answer is he's not changing anything in between. Right. He's not. He's just coming back with the same facts, asking for a different outcome. And, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different well, result. Well, this guy was completely insane. Yeah. Well, right. So if you want a different result, you've got to do something different. You've got to address what the court's concerns are. And the concern is not who's a better parent that yeah. that's that's never the question but that's or who's the question. a better lawyer even yeah. right but that's the question that seems to get into people's head right is right. they see their ex as their competition right. and getting more no you time. don't know what i'm dealing with, with right her. she's just a she's a hot mess right yeah she's letting the children play with matches and she's uh, uh, you know feeding them candy at bedtime i mean shoot <laughs> playing with matches might be concerned but <laughs> Um, (laughs) but also let me just clarify here right at the beginning that, you know, we say killer strategies for custody motions. 
you have to understand that a motion is anytime you're coming in front of the court asking for some order. And that's called different things in different states. In California, we call it a request for order right. or an RFO. The form is an FL 300. We used to call it an order to show cause. We, we did used to. Um, but so you'll hear it called FL 300, <laughs> RFO, request for order. Order to show cause. Order to show cause, a motion. You know, they might refer to forms in your state that are for that purpose. So this can go by many names, but right. essentially a motion is any time you're coming in front of the court asking for orders. Was it orders. Gladys Knight that saying, I'll second that emotion? Well, an emotion and a motion are two different things. Right, but a motion is something you second. It's never mind. Okay. Never mind. Okay, so as an attorney. Somebody got that joke, but it wasn't me, so. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you're a tough crowd. Uh, so as an attorney, I'm tasked with making miracles before the court, but I can't pull a rabbit out of a hat. Mm -hmm. I have to have something to work with. Uh, I have to have a certain kind of talking parents record, which shows that the other party is unwilling to cooperate. Or I have to have a certain uh, record that shows that there have been repeated acts of, of misconduct or not non-support of the other parent or the like. Right. And that... That, in a nutshell, is where the coaching comes in. Right. Because an attorney doesn't do that for you. That's true. The attorney pushes your case through the court system when you come to them and you need them to file a motion. Until the point where you need them to file a motion, they're out of the game. The, right. the rest of it's your personal life, right? That's right. And so you're having to manage the the way that you're interacting and the things that you're doing in such a way that's going to, as Thomas says, lay the groundwork right. for your next motion. Because if you lay that groundwork, then you come in and if somebody comes into you and they've been doing this for six, 12 months, laying the groundwork, doing everything they need to do, then you're like, Oh, piece of cake. Yeah, I wow, can this file this and win. No problem. I love this record. Yeah. Right. right. And that's not, I mean, not to, you know, you're a fantastic lawyer, so I'm not and saying I'm this to, looking. and you're good looking, but I, so I'm not saying this to belittle your skills yeah. or anything, but my point is, is that that's what you need. You're only as good as the evidence that people are bringing to you. Right. And if they're just trying to go back in and nothing's changed, honestly, I think what you would do is say, you know what, you're not ready to file your motion. Right. You need to go back and, and, you know, gather your evidence and lay groundwork and do all those things. But honestly, the vast majority of attorneys that we see don't do that. Right. They go, oh, you want to file a motion? You're going to pay me money? Okay, sure. Yeah, do Let's it. file right. a motion. Right. And then the motion is just, I want more custody. And you go before the family court services mm -hmm. recommending counselor and they say, well, there's nothing different here. Right. We're not changing anything. Right. And the court says, I'm inclined to follow the recommendations of the family court service recommending counselor unless you ha can show something is different something's got to be different right and uh, then cha-ching you just spent four to five thousand dollars for no result yeah which is fine with me i, I don't care I'll take <laughs> I, I don't think you do that i think you send people away when you really think there's nothing there to to work with I, i've never right. seen you do but that but this but, is what we call playing the long game right you know when when you get a bad result in court you know, in, you can't expect just wait a couple of months and then file another motion. Right. You have to play the long game. Right. And that means taking certain tactics that are designed to make a record for your next motion. Uh, so, Tammy, let's take this the situation where uh, you have a person on the other side who's you know, say you have a 50-50 arrangement, like a 2-2-3, two, two, and the other person uh, poaches uh, over the talking parents or by sending nasty text messages. How do you handle that? What do you mean poaches? You know, tries to take shots and get you to overreact. Oh, pokes and, at you. Yeah, pokes at you. Yeah. Right. Poaching is something entirely different, I think. But anyway. Well, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, here's what I will tell you is, People are continually amazed at the difference that tweaking your communication can make. Right. 
I mean, I go through this every day. You guys, I probably talk to 30 new people a month in my coaching practice. And then, you know, uh, I have the people that actually sign up long-term for my services. And across the board, the two comments I hear the most are, number one, I've learned more from you in the last 30, 40, 60 minutes than I have in all the years of having an attorney. Yeah. Or the last, you know, or the experts or whoever I've worked with. I mean, I hear that comment over and over. And it's not that you have a bad attorney. It's that the attorney's job is not to explain all this to you. And you need somebody that can get down on ground level and explain this in non-legal ease to you. And the second thing I get is, I can't believe the other person's responding that way. I I had somebody. Yeah, uh, tell that story. That's a good uh, story. uh, Yeah, I'll give you an example. I had. (laughs) Um, one of my VIP clients um, that's fairly new to me. And last week I said, um, you know, just don't respond to that. She, she, she texted me something and said, here's what he's saying. And, you know, I said, don't respond to that. And then something else came and I said, don't, don't respond to that. And then she's like, really? Like, I just like, like nothing. Like I just don't. Re-. And I said, no, don't respond to that. And then what happened is, and, and I mean, usually they don't oblige quite this quickly, but the guy came back with like, two or three um, messages that were like just really roasting her for not responding and saying that, you know, how emotionally upsetting this was to him that she wasn't responding and how, you know, this impacts his, his emotional mm-hmm. and mental well-being and, and, and all these things. And it was a little more um, extreme than that. I don't want to go into too much detail, but um, she took that to her lawyer and her lawyer said, oh my goodness, this is gold. <laughs> and, and she said, I never knew that just not responding could be so incredibly powerful. Right. It, it sure is. And people are very um, uh, uncomfortable with the radio silence. And you have to know when to use it and you no. have to know when not to use it because it can be held against you. So you got to have good, you know, I I had somebody send me a note today and say, hey, how how should I respond to this? Mm -hmm. And I said, "Okay, here's what I would say. And then she came back and she said, well, here's his response. She said, frankly, that's a whole lot better than I thought I was going to get from him. So she felt like what I gave her improved, you know, the situation. Because usually usually uh, your response does have some kind of emotional overtone. It may have a little bit of very subtle sarcasm in it, or it might have something. And if you can review that with a p- person that is objective, uh, then you can craft that communication in a way that's not going to be, It's first of all, it's not going to push that person's buttons. So you'll get a nicer response. You'll get more cooperation. But if they decide not to cooperate, you're creating a record. So if, if you respond with no sarcasm and no uh, subtle button pushing and they respond with a tirade, uh, you win. Right. You've got them. And, and that's yeah. exactly what we're trying to do is to is to sort of, uh, you know, I, I sort of beat them at their own game, I guess, right. is what I would call that. And, you know, right. I had uh, I have had situations where, you know, like. A common thing people do is they'll say, you know, I'm not trying to be difficult or I'm not trying to argue with you or I'm not trying to. They'll start out their sentence with that, their response with that. And it's like, don't even put that in there. As soon as you put that in there, a high conflict personality is going to go, oh, yeah, I bet you don't want to be difficult. Right. It's kind of like saying (laughs) um, uh, we need to talk. Yeah. You know, it's like, (laughs) no, we don't. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Can yeah. I can I say something to you in love? That's you, what you're in church all the time. Yeah. I want to say something to you in love. Yeah, run. Yeah. Run. Yeah. Like your hair is on fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. you really mm. have to like it it's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive. And not only is it counterintuitive, you know, I'll craft something for somebody and they go, Oh my gosh, I would have never thought of that. And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, se- 17 yeah. years of this. I mean, you have to right. consider the length of time that I've been doing this with people. Right, and and with my guys, uh, they're also amazed at at the ways that I can change 
the conversation mostly because a lot of times I consult you. Right. Uh, and the reason I consult you is because you have the gals. Because you don't know what she's thinking. Yeah. And you know what she's thinking. I do. <laughs> right. So I go to her and she says, no, you want, you don't want to use that word. Right. Whatever it is. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You, know, you want to use a different word that, that's not so harsh. But, you know, my guys have been just getting better results. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so what you want to do, I mean, I know we talk a lot about communication and I mean, we're talking about you know, strategies for custody motions, and we're going to, we're going to go on. But I think the reason that we harp on this so much is because it's the number one mistake that we see parents make across the board. Right. And it's the easiest one to fix if you get some education around what it is you need to do. And it's the most common exhibit in a child custody case of the communication. Right. And what right. I tell people is you're not going to get a result out of the communication specifically, usually, unless it's really extreme. But what you do get is credibility. Right. And credibility, as Thomas always says, puts you wearing the white hat in court. Because right. then other things you say after that, you're credible because your communication is reasonable and credible in the court's eyes. And so if you destroy your credibility through those talking parents, our family wizard, your text messages, emails, whatever communication you're using, if you're destroying your credibility in that interaction, you create an uphill battle for yourself in the courtroom. Right, right. So uh, what do you do, Tammy, in the situation where uh, your, your client comes to you, your, your coaching client, and they want to send this communication? Uh, you uh, have been late for the drop-offs and the pickups for the for three times now and last week you got to the, the pickup at 6 30 for six o'clock exchange and i had to sit in the police station and wait for you uh and you were late again yesterday please uh, drop the child off on time next time Okay, well, I would pretty much just about scrap that whole thing and tell him just to document it on the side and try to keep a log because if he's not showing up repeatedly, you could go back in and get the court to give you an order that you only have to wait for 15 minutes or so. I wouldn't go in individually for an order like that because it's kind of one of those ticky-tack things, mm -hmm. but you just kind of bear and grin it and document it until you have to go back in for something else. Here's, but here, if I was going to say something, right, right. If I was going to say something, I would say something along the lines of, hey, I, I like to start it that way. Hey, you know, I talked to my ex-husband this morning. I wasn't all like, er, girl, look at the closets, you know. Like, Is that who you were talking to? <laughs> it, you know, and it, that's, that's a quote from a sitcom. But anyway, yeah. I, I wasn't all like, you know, stern and uh, uptight about uh, it. I mean, I've known him my whole, you That's know. the way she talks to me. But. Yes, I've known him 40 <laughs> years, so I'm not being all uptight, but. And I understand a lot of times we have negative emotions towards this person. And, you know, my ex-husband had three affairs and it was very painful. And, you know, I mean, I, obviously I'm quite a ways down the road and the emotions have healed a lot. But um, one of the things that I would probably say is, hey, you know, I noticed that the last couple times you've been running late and I had to wait excessively one time. Um, I'm just wondering if you think you're going to be there at six o'clock tonight or could you please let me know if you're going to be late that's pretty nice you know that's probably what i would say and can i can i tell you what i was getting at with that question yes uh what i find as an attorney is that a lot of people are using their communications to document right or to to preserve uh evidence for later submission to the court and then they come in with these communications that are basically uh you you, you did this that or the other thing uh, and this happened at such and such a time, and they're trying to, to create a timeline. Well, hence or, my original answer. Yeah. I would have probably told them not to send that at all, and I would have probably told them to log it. I'm big on a log. You keep a log. This was probably the, I shouldn't say the one good, but the best piece of advice, and there weren't a lot, but <laughs> the best piece of advice I got from my attorney uh, in my divorce, I had a, I had, you know, I didn't have money for an attorney. I had legal insurance, fortunately at the time, but that got me a very young, inexperienced attorney that really in retrospect, you know, didn't know really a lot about what she was doing. But the one good thing that she gave me was keep a calendar of every time he visits the children because it was very sporadic. And so right. 
for me, one of the things I've learned from Thomas after doing this for so many years is you keep a log, but your log isn't in your communication. Your log is your own individual thing that he doesn't, that the other parent, he or she doesn't even see. And, you know, we talked about this before. People worry, is that evidence, whatever. It's as much yeah. evidence as it is if you type it into the the parenting app or whatever. It's it's no less evidence just because right. you wrote it on a piece of paper. Well, here's the problem. If you if you appear to be documenting your case through the communication, the court's going to see that. Right. And that doesn't make you look good. Right. It makes you look kind of petty. Uh, petty. That that was the word. That's a good word. The one that was coming to my mind, uh, I would have hesitated to say. So, uh, yeah, it's petty. It's it's small. It uh, let, you... let me say it's petty in the court's eyes. Right. I know this is nerve wracking when you have somebody that's not showing up and you're exhausted and you've worked all day and the kid's cranky and hungry and whatever. I get all the practical side of so, that. But in the court's eyes, this is a petty issue. So let me tell you how I present that in court. So you've got your your talking parents communications or your text messages and you're all nice. They look all really good. And then you have this diary, like Tammy was saying, that uh, that documents the exchanges, it documents, you know, you get this, uh, uh, he doesn't show up and he doesn't step up to the plate and all this stuff. So yeah. you've got this log. Uh, and so there's a doctrine in evidence that's called present recollection recorded. And it, would this be like nationwide or is this a Yeah, this thing? is this is something we learn in law school. Okay, 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 just to be clear. So if you've kept a diary, you know, most people can't remember. I mean, I can't even remember what I had for breakfast this morning. <laughs> you know, most people can't remember something that happened six months ago. Right. Uh, so it's really easy to impeach them on their memory. They don't know what day it had. They don't know what time it was. They don't know. Uh, so if it's recorded, if you make a conscious practice of recording that evidence at the time that the, the thing happened, when your memory is still fresh, you're, uh, first of all, if you can remember, you can use that diary to refresh your recollection, and that will enhance your credibility. Or if you absolutely can't remember, you can, you can introduce the writing. Because it, it has credibility because it was made at the time of the event. Right. And you want to include dates, times. And what I always tell people is like, look, if you're in doubt, write it down. Because inevitably what happens is. I'm not when, finished. Oh, I'm sorry. But let me just yeah. throw this in real okay. quick. Inevitably what happens is, is you go along and by the time you get ready for a motion, uh -huh. you don't know which ones of those events are going to be significant. Right. Well, that's true. Yeah, I think you you have to you know, err on the side of of writing it down and and uh, and having detail. But let's say that you're uh, in a court battle, and he says or she says your opponent says that never happened. She is out to lunch. That never happened. Well, you've got a record that was made at the time the event happened. Who's the judge going to believe, him or you? Yeah, or her or you. Which <laughs> so, yeah. the court wants to know what really happened. Yeah, because the yeah. one person is vaguely going, oh, that didn't happen. And the other person is going, well, uh, actually, Your Honor, I, I keep an ongoing journal. And in my journal on December 15th, 2022, at 6.30 p.m., I wrote down that I had left the exchange point because uh, Dad had not arrived for his six o'clock pickup, you know, whatever. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, you, then you, then, like I said, you've just enhanced your credibility because you've got the date, you've got the time, you've got the details. That's much more convincing than that never happened. Right. So how about this scenario? You know, my guys complain a lot about this, uh, that the child, uh, goes back and forth between the houses and then mom says, she doesn't want to transition or he doesn't want to transition back. And your experience is, well, when the child transitions back to me, yeah, there is a period of adjustment mm -hmm. and then it, everything's fine. Right. But mom's over there saying, well, she doesn't. Uh, uh, the child doesn't want to go. The child just doesn't want to go. So what, what do we do in that situation? How do we make a record? 
Yeah. I mean, I think, I think if you're dad and that's the situation that's coming up, I think that you, you know, you have a few options. Um, I would want the child in therapy. That's always my first thing I ask people is the child in therapy. Right. Um, and you would want to document, you know, Friday, you know, 6 PM went to pick the child up. You know, mom said, mom sent me a message saying child doesn't want to transition. You know, if you have specific court orders that say you're to pick up Friday at 6 p.m., you can actually call the police and they'll come and they'll talk to mom and the child. And if it's really mom and the child really wants to transition, that might get it done. If the, you know, if the child is also saying that that they don't want to transition, you know, I think then you have to kind of look at long term strategies of. Are you really building your bond with the child? Are you interacting with the child when they're there in your home? Are you, you know, making it a loving, nurturing, safe environment for them? You know, all those kinds of things that we see children resist. Mm -hmm. You know, is there a hiccup when we have a transition? Yes, always. I never, ever, ever see a child that right. just, you know, I mean, maybe if they've been doing it for a real, like Thomas's kids started at one and two, generally by I would say 11, 12, we didn't have any issues. But I can remember even at eight years old, I remember your younger son crying and saying, I don't want to go back to mom's. Yeah. You know, and our response was always, I'm, you know, this is, this is your mom's parenting time. She's missed you. You need to go, you know, and if your mom in that situation and you're saying, oh, the child doesn't want to go, I would be telling you do everything you can to encourage the child to go, lest you be seen as the barrier to the child's parenting time with that. And if there really are concerns on the other end, my yeah. experience is eventually, whether it's mom or dad, the child will eventually absolutely refuse if there really are severe issues right. going if on in one safety, of the homes. It, safety issues. Right, right. Eventually I, that usually comes to, to yeah. fruition. I'd say mo but, most of the guys in, in, my, in my group coaching are, uh, are good fathers. Right, yeah. right. It's, the, ju it's just you right. have, you know, I think especially yeah. when kids start hitting 10, 11, 12, it's hard because they really want a home base, Yeah, you know, and that shifting is really difficult. And if the kid's having a hard time transitioning, you know, maybe you need longer stretches, maybe mm -hmm. you need things like that. But I would definitely be documenting it. I'd be trying to get the child into therapy. I would be focusing on, you know, talking to the child about, hey, next time you come back, we used to do this with your kids. Right. Hey, next time you come back, we're going to take a trip down to, you know, Right. Sea World, and you know, spend the day, or we're going to drive up to Santa Barbara and you know, spend the day at the ocean there on the you know, at the pier or whatever. And so, you know, just little things that we know they enjoy, well, we would always kind of talk to them about it. But one of the things that I see a lot in, in my litigation practice is parents saying, Well, you don't believe me, I'll record it. Yeah, okay. and then you, you get this recording of the child having a tantrum about transitioning. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I just, I think that looks really bad. Well, it does, because if you're recording, then you're, it's not spontaneous on your part. You're recording the thing that's in your favor, right? right? And so the court recognizes that. And I mean, sometimes the court will order that you can record for safety reasons or whatever, but, and it's not always that anybody dis it's not always that someone doesn't believe you that the child's having a tantrum. We believe you. That's pretty yeah. common. The problem is, is that it's common and you need to make the child transition right. anyway. I hate cell phone recording yeah. between parents. You know what it is? Because they're having conflict. Yeah. And if they're having conflict, that hurts the child. Yeah. And it really doesn't make either parent look right. good. Yeah. Because the court's going, okay, people are recording each other having conflict. Why isn't somebody stopping this so that... <laughs> <laughs> so that the child isn't witnessing that. that right. That's what's going through the court's mind. Right. Yeah. I find in general, if you focus on your parenting, on the positive aspects of your parent, uh, so don't worry about what she's doing. Don't worry that the child is having tantrums at mom's uh, on transition. Don't, you know, okay, don't worry about it. Uh, my experience is a couple of things. First of all, the child loves you. You know, if, if you have a warm relationship that you've developed with a child, uh, especially a young child, like a toddler or, or, or like a kindergartner, uh, they just, they can't get enough of you. Uh, and, you know, teenagers are a little different. But by then, hopefully you've established a relationship. But I find that 
that you can tell from a good parent, like you know, a warm parent who steps up to the plate and really uh, takes on all the aspects of parenting. You can tell that yeah. from the declarations, from the testimony. Uh, and I think the solution is to to the parental alienation stuff is to just be a great parent, right? And focus on building relationships. I mean, do you read to the child? Do you read bedtimes? They love that. Right. They love that. Yeah. And I I think what happens is when we get divorced, it's like mom's very nurturing at most. Mm -hmm. And this is this is sort of stereotypical and I'm not trying to necessarily be that way. But as women, we generally tend to be the more nurturing parent and men tend to be the more disciplinarian parent. That's true. Most of the time. Not always. But, you know, if you're the more nurturing parent. Well, you're going to have to learn to shore up the discipline a little bit in your household. And I don't think you can even do that through like a new mate. Like, you know, Thomas and I got married about three years after my divorce, but I couldn't just hand that off because my kids resented it. And guys, (laughs) your daughter needs a hug sometimes. Right. And I think dads, the challenge is kind of, it's you know, taking on some of that nurturing stuff. You know, I had a dad the other night that said to me, well, you know, the child wants his back scratch before bed for heaven's sake. He's 10 or 11 years old. I'm not going to scratch his back just because his mother does. And I said, okay, but let's take a step back from that. You don't have to do that exact thing. It doesn't have to be the exact same in your world. That just tells me that the child's looking for some kind of connection. Right. And you're sort of refusing that out of some belief that that somehow it is unreasonable for him to, for the child to ask for. And I said to the dad, just to find something. I said, you know, read to him at bedtime. Do something that puts you in the room and puts you in close proximity, but it doesn't have to be actually physically touching him if you're uncomfortable with that. Well, seeing, I mean, this is just human nature, that turning down a bid for affection is generally not ingratiating. Right. Uh, I know that sometimes my feelings get hurt if Tammy, you know, if I kind of make a bid for affection if I put my arm around her and she doesn't feel like being touched that day. So she kind of shirks away and, you know, and, you know, that hurts. And I think what this dad is doing in particular is he feels like mom's coddling and he's trying to shore that up. He's trying to teach that boy to be a man. That's right. That's (laughs) what he's doing. That's right. But the thing is, is that you, that's not going to counterbalance what's happening in mom's home right you have to try to make your home balanced within itself here's what i say about that watch an nba basketball game and watch how much those men those slap each other's butts (laughs) they hug each other and they i mean they don't just you know at the end of the game uh they don't just shake hands yeah they go up and they give a full body hug yeah and you know, men have, and it is different from women. Yeah. But you can have physical contact with your children. You right. have to. Right. Right. And so you have to try to kind of create balance. My in your little home. granddaughters, they love sitting on my knee. I know. They just love it. And I, I just hold them and they cuddle. <laughs> and yeah. They love that. Yeah. And, and I, and again, I think moms on the other end, you have to try to kind of balance things and, Make sure that you're, you know, disciplining and holding, you know, that that line in your home and all that, because as they get to be teenagers, you lose control if you don't do that. So you kind of have the opposite problem later. Dad has more problem when they're young. Usually mom has more problem when they're older. Right. But to get back to our. Right. No, I'm talking about I'm still talking about the motion. Yeah. No, you have to lay you, you have to be patient. Right. And. You have to, it takes time to bond with children. Yeah. So you have to, to forge that bond. You have to be nice in your communication. Uh, you have to not fire back. Uh, and you have to refrain from documenting your case with your communication. Right. Uh, right. Instead, keep a diary. And all of these things, any one thing is not going to turn the case. Right. Unless it's, oh, you know. You know, sexual molestation or some something really domestic extreme. violence in front of the child, right. or you driving yeah. drunk with the child, or something extreme. Something extreme. So, so you you want to just create 
a trail or a wrap. What what is your word for that? I don't know. I say lay the groundwork is what yeah, I call it. Yeah, breadcrumbs or something. breadcrumbs. Yes, I use breadcrumbs a lot. Breadcrumbs. Yeah. You gotta yeah. just and and you just a little breadcrumb here, a little bit there, and 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 pretty soon you look like the good guy, and your opponent looks like the one that's nitpicky, right? The one that's being petty, right? Right. And so, but you really, you have to intentionally shift that. You have to know what's the result you want. What are you going for? What strategies do you need to get there? Right. And then what are the steps to fulfill those strategies? If you're just flying off the handle because you got a bad result and you're right. emotional and you're going to go back in and file within, you know, a month or two of your, of the court's last decision, you're probably not going to get a different outcome. Right. And and that's that's where we can really help. You know, I've been right. doing this for for 35 years and you know, I'm a little tired of litigating, but I love working with guys that that just want to be good parents and yeah. just they want to have a connection with their sons and daughters. Uh and and I teach them, you know, how to make that connection. I know cuz I'm good at it. Right. I'm good at it with my kids. Yes. Uh and I can teach that to you. Yeah. And I can teach you how to, as a litigator, I can teach you how to make a record that's that's going to win your case in the long run. Right. Right. And that's what you have to start to understand, because like Thomas said, you can go out and hire the biggest, baddest attorney in town. But if you don't have the goods to give them, so to speak, they're not going to really be able to shift the result either. You know, right. It's you. You got to start with you. You have to take the right steps first. Right. Episode one. Right. <laughs> episode one, that was the episode one of this podcast was called The Key Is You. And it's still true. It's the thing we've been preaching since day one. And yeah. other pe people want to focus on the court and the other parent and all these different things. And, you know, or the evaluator or the guardian ad litem or the, you know, whatever. It, it all starts with you. That's the first thing that you can change and control. And if you start with that, it will have a ripple effect, a domino effect, and the other things will start to change as well. Right. You know, you'll start to see, we had this in a case several years ago, we talk about sometimes where we had, Thomas had dad, and he was just so gruff, and he was self-represented, and he was just getting door slammed in his face. They had minors counsel, court wouldn't listen to him, mm -hmm. doctors wouldn't listen to him, nobody. And I started really getting in his face so to speak not literally because it would be phone calls but I'd Tammy be, does get in your face I, I would be backing him down and being like dude you can't do this do, right. do you want your child do, do you want custody like you gotta stop you gotta right. you gotta control yourself and after about I would say four to six months that case com about six months it I think it, it completely flipped and he got full custody right yeah but but he it really took a lot of management yeah, intense and, management of his and responses I, and, this guy's and actions. A, I, I know who you're talking about, and he's a good guy. He's, he is. A, he's a good father. Yes, he loves he just, that child. Uh huh. He's just he's he has harsh manners in it, you know, like working class harsh manners. Well, he's just yeah. kind of a "this is who I am, take it or leave it" kind of guy. Yeah, you know, I can relate to that. I'm kind of <laughs> like that. It's like this is me. I yeah. either you like me or you don't. You mm. know, people have comment on the podcast. Oh, you're laughing too much. Well. I, then we're probably not the people for you because I can't just sit around and, right. you know. And we're very cry. serious about this. Well, yeah, yeah, we've both been through it and I know how hard it is, but I can't just sit and cry in my soup. That's not going to help any anybody that's listening, you know, and it's got to be at least. Uh, and it ruins the soup. <laughs> it does. And it's got to be <laughs> semi-entertaining at least. You yeah. know, the subject is very dry and it's very intense and it's very, uh, it, it's very emotional and painful and. You know, so you got to bring a little bit of lighthearted. Yeah. This is we we talk about this stuff all the time. We do. This is pretty much like living with us. This is like this be is glad you like. don't live with us. That's all, I, <laughs> that's all I can say. Be glad you don't live with us because this is what it's like. Yeah. So, OK, so we hope that's helpful. I, I know we kind of like weren't in the technicality of the motion so much, but the technicality isn't where it's won and lost. Your that's strategy true. leading up to it is where it's won and lost. And that's what people lose sight of. Correct. Um, if you're listening to the podcast, please uh, rate and review us and also subscribe as you so you get notified as new episodes are released. If you're watching us on YouTube, don't forget to hit like below this video and also subscribe so you get notified as new videos are released each week. And thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you.
Thank you for listening to the Divorce University online podcast with your hosts, Thomas and Tammy Ferreira. For more information, visit www.divorceuniversityonline.com.